Right, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to the second Vet Oracle Teleneurology Facebook Live. Um, I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Simon, which we will be asking questions to our guest speaker, Mark um, Larry. Um, this uh, live is brought to you by Vet Oracle Teleneurology, um, which is a company that Simon and I run with a fantastic uh, team of um, very talented radiologists. And we provide you, in case you're not familiar with this company, we provide you with imaging report on your neuro MRI or neuro CT with the added benefit that we also um, provide you with our clinical experience on how to manage these cases. Um, if you're interested, just visit our website, uh, vetoracle.com for more details. Tonight, um, we've got uh, a brilliant speaker, Mark Larry, which we will discuss with you paroxysmal dyskinesia. Before I introduce Mark, I just wanted to say a, a, a special uh, thanks to a, a, a support group um, of uh, pet owner, which is the CECS or canine epileptoid cramping syndrome, and especially Jane Gale. I know you're watching Jane. Um, this is to remind you that all the research that we've done over the years um, uh, with Mark were, won't have been able to do that without the support of pet owner. And um, Jane may remember that we had a lot of hurdles to try to put all these cases together. Um, a lot of resistance as well. We managed to overcome that, and that resulted in fantastic research paper. So thanks a lot to all the pet owner and all this support group uh, for being there and helping us um, doing this research. Now it's time to introduce Mark Larry, who is a very close friend of Simon and I. Um, Mark and I um, used to work together at Davis, and now we work together um, at, uh, at CVS Referral. Mark, as I say, is a brilliant speaker. He's also uh, a, an excellent clinician. Um, the type of clinician that Simon and I really value, no nonsense approach to clinical neurology. Um, he's also published a lot on paroxysmal dyskinesia and is probably you know, a, a world leader in the topic of dyskinesia without a doubt with all the publication uh, he put. So that um, leave me to um, let Simon ask a few questions that you've already submitted um, to ask to Mark about this fascinating topic of paroxysmal dyskinesia. Simon, over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laurent. Um, and thanks, Mark, for being with us. I really appre appreciate that. As Laurent says, um, we're, we uh, are honored to have you here talking about this subject, which you've done a lot of work on. And so to get started for our listeners, um, uh, why don't you start off with explaining what is paroxysmal dyskinesia and why is all the attention uh, now suddenly focused on on this area? What's changed recently? Yeah, thanks, Simon, and also to the Ron. So, um, yeah, paroxysmal dyskinesia. Well, it's um, the way to think about it. It's a type of movement disorder that we see commonly in dogs, also in cats, less commonly in cats, but it's certainly something we do encounter there. I think the, the thing about it at the moment, the way I see it is there is a huge amount of tension right now on it. But um, I'd want to sort of highlight, it goes way back. So if I get this first slide up, um, it sort of goes way back to 1969. Now, I'm prepared to be contested on this by anybody. But um, showing this first picture, the first publication I found was this one on hyperkinetic episodes in Scottish terrier dogs, so Scotty Cramp. And as it happens, it was published the same week as the moon landing. So the message here really is it's been going on for years and years and years. Now, there were, there were sporadic reports over the years in the sort of 70s and the 80s, and again through the 90s, but it's only been the last 10 to 20 years that really it's come more to the forefront. And I think the reason we could probably blame technology, um, the smartphone. So everyone's got this opportunity now to be at home, and watch their dogs having whatever funny episode it is they're having and they're able to capture it on their phone and bring it into the vets for us to have a look at. In the past, we relied on descriptions from owners, some quite unusual descriptions from owners. Owners might even do a, a few impressions of what the dog might be up to so we could draw our own conclusions. And I think many of us, neurologists included, probably incorrectly called these episodes seizures, potentially partial seizures. So with a smartphone, you've got a really good way of working out what's going on with these dogs. I should declare an interest here. I'm probably the only person on this broadcast right now that doesn't have a smartphone. That's my, my phone, just there. We'll get a few pens from Nokia for product placement there, but um, that's my phone, so I can't do this, but I know everybody else out there 
is able to do it very well. The other big thing, and I think Laurent touched on it at the beginning, is we've had some brilliant support from social network groups. So Jan Gale is, is one of the people behind that. But people are able to get on social media and share what their dog's doing. And so it means groups of um, owners are, are really on top of this and understand a lot more what's happening before some of us vets do. So that's really driven things. And I suppose the final thing is genetic advancement. There are a couple of breeds out there now that have um, a genetic mutation identified and that's really made us realize this this is a thing you know it's not something we've made up it's not a pretend condition it really is a, a condition in its own right and we're getting more and more information on it all the time great thanks very much um being the only person on this video uh, call that remembers 1969 i will tell you it wasn't a long time ago laurent doesn't remember it and that's not because he's swigging beer right now that is um which i caught uh, <laughs> that is because he is a youngster. Anyway, moving on, on um, based on that video footage that, that we often get, how, how do you tell between a paroxysmal dyskinesia and an epileptic seizure? Well, that's a, a really good question. It's something I think is a big challenge. You know, um, If we put up the next slide, what, we, what we've done is we've um, we, we tried to write some guidelines on this to um, determine how do we know it's a movement disorder and not... Um, not an epileptic seizure. So we produced this publication. I think the gist of it comes down to the fact that um, an epileptic seizure is, is something where you get manifestations in all four legs, as you do a movement disorder, but actually you also lose consciousness. Now, if you've got abnormal movements in all four of your legs and you're having these episodes, you will lose consciousness because that's a generalized um, seizure. So if it's, if, sorry, if it's a seizure, it's a generalized seizure. So you're losing consciousness, you're unaware of what's going on. With a movement disorder, it's actually um, quite typical to get that movement to all four legs, but you retain awareness. So this dog will be completely aware of what's going on around them when they're doing this. The other big thing is that um, dogs can have anything from a short episode, typically like you'd see in a seizure, through to quite long episodes. Some of these dogs are having episodes for an hour or more when they're having an epileptic, um, a, a paroxysmal dyskinesia. Now, if a dog had an episode, an epileptic seizure lasting that long, they would have a post ictal period that would last hours, days, weeks. Whereas with all movement disorders, dogs snap back out of it straight away. So they seem much more aware of um, what's happening immediately following the episode and don't seem to be too um, problematic in that way. The other thing to say is, I guess, with these dogs, they don't show autonomic signs when they have a movement disorder. So no salivating, no urination, no defecation. And you could argue, so you could say, well, actually, these movement disorders, maybe they're a type of partial seizure. Maybe that's what's going on. But we're yet to see a movement disorder that progresses into a typical generalized tonic-clonic seizure, whereas many partial seizures will indeed progress to a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So those are the distinctions that kind of help you know the difference between an epileptic seizure and um, a paroxysmal dyskinesia. Great, some good points there. Um, well, what is behind this then? What is the pathophysiology and, and are there any breed predispositions we should be aware of? Yeah, well, I think it's probably widely accepted now. I mean, this is a human condition as well as a veterinary condition. So I think it's widely accepted. It originates from the basal ganglia. Lots of studies that look at um, lesions in the basal ganglia that can cause movement disorders in people um, and other conditions that can affect that area resulting in movement disorders. They are mostly hereditary in dogs, so there's a lot of breed predispositions out there. Um, I think it's fair to say that you've got um, you've got you've got some genetic ones that we're aware of in Cavaliers and in soft coated weakened terriers, and also Border Terriers as well. Another breed. There's lots that I could probably mention. The most important thing to say there is just because a breed might not have a named paroxysmal dyskinesia associated with it, doesn't rule it out as a condition. I actually believe any breed get the paroxysmal dyskinesia in spite of the hereditary predisposition. The other thing you can get with movement disorders is you can get ones that are, um, are secondary to something else, a bit like with epileptic seizures. Epileptic seizures can be um, idiopathic epilepsy or can be related to a structural underlying cause. So we can find dogs that have structural underlying causes for their movement disorders. I suppose cats are something to raise here. I, I found a few cats now that have movement disorders with an underlying cause. Now, got to be careful how we think about that. So whether the underlying cause is truly causing the paroxysmal dyskinesia or whether it's just triggered a predisposition in that patient to have a movement disorder, I'm not sure, but we see a lot of that. So MRI is often quite a good thing to perform in these patients. 
drugs can cause it, reports of phenobarbital and propofol triggering movement disorders. And then going back to border terriers, um, gluten. So where that stands, we're not too sure. We've looked into it a bit, but gluten seems to trigger these episodes. And interestingly, interestingly enough, that happens in, um, in people as well. Um, so yeah, a whole host of things there as to, we don't really know the underlying cause, but they're, they're the sorts of ideas that surround many of these conditions. And so you, you know, you've mentioned a lot of characteristics there. What, what would you use typically to diagnose um, paroxysmal dyskinesia? Yeah, well, the, the main problem is there isn't really a single test, so to speak. So we can't do a single test and have a diagnosis. It's really um, a diagnosis of exclusion. So many of the times we'd be recommending doing tests just simply to ensure we don't have other diseases that mimic the condition. Um, and we'll come back to that in a bit, I guess. But um, yeah, diagnosis by inspection is the main thing. Now, that's a really low bar you have to reach. I mean, just to be able to sit there and go, yes, this dog looks like it's got a movement disorder, therefore it is, is not great. We've got a few things we can do now. I mean, if we put up the next slide, um, there's a couple of studies now. I've mentioned them already on these genetic disorders. So, you know, if you see one of these breeds, the top one here is one that um, looks at the, the Brevacan mutation in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels with so-called episodic falling syndrome. Now, this looks like any other movement disorder, in, well, most movement disorders in dogs. There's nothing particularly defining about it other than the fact that these patients have this gene mutation. I'm always cautious with that, though, because you will get cavaliers out there that don't have the mutation, yet they will have signs that are very typical of a movement disorder. So what's going on in those patients? Well, well, I think those patients still have a movement disorder. They just don't have this movement disorder. They probably have a, another type. So when you don't have a brevicam mutation in a cavalier um, with, a, with a, what signs are compatible with a movement disorder, then I, I don't rule this out. You can flip that on its head. I mean, in this actual study itself, there were a couple of dogs, I believe, that were homozygous for the mutation, but didn't have any clinical signs. So getting a positive mutation doesn't necessarily mean those dogs will be showing clinical signs. Um, so we've got to be careful with genetic testing. The lower one there is the most recent um, genetic mutation that's come out of soft-coated wheat and terriers with a movement disorder, um, the pigeon mutation. So that's a, a really easy thing to do if you've got one of those breeds. Do I test this in other breeds? I don't actually. I've, I've yet to find a positive. I know many of us around the world are testing these all the time and no one's come up with this being positive in other breeds. So I don't really see the value of doing this in other dogs. The other one to mention is, is with border terriers. We'll come back to them with the gluten. So if we put up the next slide, there's been a, there's been a bit of work that we've done. Um, so Laron and I have looked at this um, where we wanted to measure the antibodies. Um, that we typically see in people that are produced to gluten. So in people, we're aware of celiac disease. Um, celiac disease is a really severe gut disease associated with a gluten allergy. But in people, they also found this thing that's been termed a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Now, the background on that is these are people that have an, an intolerance, if you like, to gluten, and it's manifest in some other way, not necessarily through gut signs, some of these patients might have a sort of skin rash that's so manifest through the skin. Some of them, as it happens, have episodes of um, dystonia, which is a clinical sign associated with dyskinesia, with a movement disorder. So they may suffer gut signs. They don't have to suffer gut signs, but they get these other problems too. So we took the antibodies that you measure in these people and we measured them in dogs. So these are the results here. The two antibodies we looked at were anti-gliadin antibodies and anti-transglutaminase 2 antibodies. And, and you'll see from the graph the, on both charts, the left bar is dogs that had signs compatible, so border terriers that had signs compatible with so-called canine epileptoid cramping syndrome. And on the right, we've got our control dogs, which were sort of um, breed matched controls. You can see a real obvious disparity there. So the dogs that had clinical signs of paroxysmal dyskinesia had a really high levels of these antibodies versus the normal patients. We took that one step further. So if we go on to the next slide, um, we actually then monitored these dogs through a period of time. So we started them at the beginning on the left side of both of these graphs. We, um, this was presentation and we started them on a gluten-free diet. Now I've always been a bit mindful of this, you know, gluten-free diet does sound a bit voodoo. Is that, is that really gonna work and fix these dogs? Well, 
in five of the dogs, we had six dogs in this study in total, but in five of the dogs, it worked really, really well. And their trajectory of their antibody over nine months is shown in these graphs. The gray bar at the bottom is the normal range. So you can see they really came back down either within the normal range or just above it when starting the gluten-free diet. Um, the other dog, I mean, the sick dog didn't respond, but the more we looked into that, we realized um, as most terriers are, they're very difficult to adhere to a gluten-free diet. And um, it worked on a stables, this dog, and frequently um, found horse feces, which it enjoyed to feast upon, which of course rich in gluten. So as soon as we actually removed that source of gluten from that dog, it similarly responded in a similar way. The final um, thing I want to put up here, so if we put up the next slide, is really to talk um, a little bit about those mimics, those things that look like movement disorders but aren't. So there's a whole host of them here, but I think probably the one I'd want to raise the most on this um, on this slide would be um, the mention of the tetany or the hypercalcemia. So, of course, we're doing metabolic workups in these patients. When I get them in, I do a typical workup like you would for dogs with epileptic seizures. You do your extracranial workup, looking at the metabolic problems and then moving to intracranial problems. But I find an ionized calcium is really important in many of these patients because the one thing that you can see on video that can mimic really well a paroxysmal dyskinesia is, is, is tetany or hypercalcemia. So by checking that, you can really make sure you've ruled that out and not get, um, well, not slip up in mistaking what might be going on there. Great. Well, it's, it's pretty comprehensive and fascinating stuff with the gluten, um, particularly at a time when people are starting to get a lot, lot more knowledge now about that whole gut brain access. Um, you've mentioned a little bit then about how you would treat the, these disorders if you can find uh, an underlying cause. But in general, how, how do you manage paroxysmal dyskinesias? Yeah, um, you know, I think I think probably the most um, common thing I do is I don't do very much with treatment in the vast majority of dogs. Um, I'll put up the next slide because the next slide does show a few of the treatments that you could consider because I think, you know, it's, it's all right very well to say we don't treat them, but I think it's important to know what's out there and what you can use. And these are probably three of the choices, probably in the order I'd consider using them for many of these dogs. However, these, it's, it's, again, I go back to the, the analogy with epileptic seizures, that actually treatment for epileptic seizures is full of side effects. And many owners prefer the occasional um, seizure from their pet than actually putting them on medication that gives persistent side effects. And I'd say exactly the same is true of movement disorders. But of course, in movement disorders, they're fairly benign conditions. Um, one thing I've become aware of is they don't appear to be life-threatening. I'm not going to say they're never life-threatening. I don't can ever use the words such as never because I know what tomorrow's patient's going to bring. But actually, they do tend to be um, non-life-threatening, fairly benign, but they're also life-limiting. Um, if we put up the next slide, in fact, that shows something that we did. We worked, again, Laurent and I did some work in Jack Russell's and Labrador's. And this was the study we came up with. But um, looking at the Labrador side of that study, we followed um, Labrador's for really a long period that presented with movement disorders. Now, of all of those Labrador's we studied, we found that 40% of them actually went into remission. So that's quite a large number. And... Of those 40%, well, half of them went into remission within two years of their first episode, and half of them took a little bit longer. You know, they could might have taken over two years. But if you if you have that information available to an owner when you diagnose their dog with a movement disorder, I think that's a really useful thing for them to know. Unlike epileptic seizures that tend to progress with time, and I think this is another good argument to put in there. The people who kind of think that seizures and movement disorders may be the same thing. Well, this is the evidence I'd put there to say. Well, yeah, we know seizures, kindling phenomenon, seizures getting worse and worse with time. It seems to be the opposite with movement disorders. Movement disorders tend to improve with time. A further thing to add here is of those dogs that didn't go into remission, the vast majority of them had cluster episodes. And we defined a cluster episode as you would by saying more than one episode in a 24-hour period. So when presented for, with a Labrador, this is a really useful bit of information to give an owner to say, if your dog's having cluster episodes, and they're unlikely to go into remission. They're never fatal, but you know they, they, they're unlikely to go into remission. Whereas if they're having single episodes, then there is a good chance over the course of that dog's life it might enter remission. Um, the other thing to say, of course, is 
you know, I say I don't do treatment much, so I don't do medication. I might avoid doing treatment unless it's really affecting a dog's quality of life. But of course, going back to border terriers, there's that gluten-free diet. So um, that is something I definitely do in, in borders to try it out. But again, if an owner is really struggling to keep a dog on a gluten-free diet, I don't, I don't think they need to force it. You know, if a dog has the occasional episode, it's not a real, real problem. So much better to try and um, try and manage things as best you can with the diet. And if you're not completely strict and you can't get rid of every episode, then that's not really a problem. Great. That highlights how important it is to know the natural history of a disease before you decide just to jump in and treat it. Um, excellent. So finally, have you got any top tips you want to give our followers on uh, on paroxysmal dyskinesia in general? Anything that we haven't men mentioned at this stage? Yeah. So, uh, well, for me, whenever I'm approached for any request, then I think the main thing is to always get a video. So if ever you have an owner, or there's an owner out there that has a dog having funny episodes, I'd strongly encourage you to get a video of it because that's probably our, our strongest diagnostic test still. It's not a great diagnostic test, but it's probably the best thing we have without genetic markers. Um, but I think the other thing is, is once you've got your diagnosis, for the owner, the most important thing is to educate that owner. So client education is really, really important because medication isn't often necessary and I think spending that extra time going through it with an owner and letting them know what to expect taking them through things like this graph we've got here is really important and helpful for them and for them to know that it's not really um not really a severe condition once you get familiar with what's going on um and I suppose the other thing I've come across is you ask an owner to do this and they'll go away and they really struggle to get an episode on video and I think that speaks volumes I think if you've got an owner that goes away and they're struggling to get a representative video um, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll say it's because the episodes are too infrequent. Well, that's all right. If they're too infrequent, we're not that worried at this stage. But the other thing they might say is maybe the episodes are too short in duration and we can't actually capture it in time. Well, both those things are quite, I think that's, that's a reason to offer your reassurance, actually, that these patients um, may not be too concerning at that stage. And if it does become more frequent or longer in duration, then that's definitely something to consider. You know, I think probably the final thing, I mean, I've talked today about paroxysmal dyskinesias and I've mentioned their sort of place as part of movement disorders. But if we sort of take a step back and look at movement disorders, the big problem I always have with these is trying to determine exactly what's going on here and there. Now, Laurent and I have done some reviews and classified these different types of movement disorders. But I thought what I wanted to give everyone tonight, if we put the next slide up, something that we've been working on, is more of an algorithm. Now, it probably doesn't come across too well on this screen at the moment, but we can probably provide this um, on, on the website later. Um, but this is um, an algorithm that really takes you through the, the clinical signs to look at with a patient to decide what is that movement disorder. You know, is it, is it a paroxysmal dyskinesia? Is it tetany? We've talked about that today. Could it be a myokemia? So one of the peripheral nerve hyperexcitabilities or, or whatever it might be. So that chart I find quite useful to work through and um, to ascertain exactly what it is a patient's presenting when you do get those videos to be clients. That's great. Yeah, that's a good place to, to end. Um, thank you very much for, for answering those questions. That was really helpful on a on a very tough um, um, exp and rapidly evolving subject. I'm going to hand back to Laurent. Um, good luck with what you get right now because he seems to have been swigging quite a bit of beer in the meantime. Um, but uh, I'll let him take over from here. It's quite hot here in Bedford, so um, I need to rehydrate a little bit. Um, we've got some fantastic questions, actually. I'm going to put them on the screen. I don't know if you can see it, Mark, from um, uh, Michael Benaim. I think it's an excellent question. Which primary cause of paroxysmal dyskinesia other than gluten allergy and genetic mutation have you identified in dog? And have you ever seen a dog with a brain neoplasia or inflammatory disease um, with paroxysmal dys dyskinesia? Any um, lesion that could be identified on advanced imaging or CSF? Basically, yeah, that, that, have you really found a structural cause? Yeah, so I think um, regarding primary cause, then the simple answer is there's no other genetic mutations that have been found. And to my knowledge at this stage, um, the gluten is the only thing we found, apart from the ones I mentioned with drugs. You know, you've got those secondary causes there. But for a primary cause, um, nothing else has yet been identified. Um, have I seen a dog with an intracranial lesion that has a movement disorder? Well, the simple answer is yes. But this comes back to the situation of, is it actually the neoplasia? or the inflammation causing the paroxysmal dyskinesia? Or is it that that dog 
has a has a tendency to have movement disorders already, a paroxysmal dyskinesia already, and the stress of that disease has actually precipitated it. Um, so yes, we've seen it. What's going on there? I'm I'm not entirely sure. And I think the problem you'll have if you are faced with those patients is trying to prove that the intracranial lesion you've identified on cross-sectional imaging is actually the reason for the dog's paroxysm of dyskinesia. Absolutely. Um, we've got another really good question um, as well from Emily, um, which basically say that um, if the phenotypic feature are very likely from the video of paroxysmal dyskinesia, you rule out any structural cause, will you put this dog on a gluten-free diet? When do you decide to do that? Uh, or is it specific to the border terrier? Yeah, no, really good question. So I think that's that's important to think about what we're talking about breed-wise here. So if it's a border terrier and you've done all of these things, then of course, yes, I would go and put these dogs on a gluten-free diet and see what happens. You've got nothing to lose. It's quite an easy process um, and it won't cause any harm at all. So in a border terrier, yes, I would do the diet. Now, if we're looking at other breeds, I'm still um, looking at trying to establish these antibodies in other breeds. We don't have any controls. So take a Labrador as an example. If you've got a Labrador with a movement disorder, trying to do a um, the, the gluten anti antibody testing is not too reliable at this stage because we've yet to get breed match controls to actually give a true answer and a true reflection of what's going on with those antibodies. I suppose I'd add to that, but I've not convincingly seen that many dogs respond to a gluten-free diet, but you're always going to get the odd one here and there. So there's, again, nothing wrong with putting them on a gluten-free diet. But do I think it's likely to help? I would tell an owner it's probably unlikely to help. But again, it's an easy thing to do. I would agree. I don't know if Simon, uh, I've never had a dog outside of Border Terrier responding to gluten-free diet. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of confusion among even some of us uh, but automatically we put on the gluten-free diet when it's not a border terrier. But at the moment, we haven't, we have only proved this link in the border terrier and no other breed. So it's important, I think, to, um, to remind everyone. Um, yeah, another no, no, question. just to add yeah. to that, just to add to that, Laurent, I mean, your, Mark, your previous point about the natural history of these diseases that they go into remission. Um, if it, if that happens at the time they put them on the diet, the concern is they're on an expensive diet for, for the rest of their life on the belief that it's actually worked. So I guess that's another concern. Um, the next question, is it possible to see autonomic sign in some breed with dyskinesia, like urination or defecation? I think the reverse is, can you use autonomic sign or not as a way to differentiate dyskinesia from a seizure? Yeah, no, and that is a really good question. So when I talk about autonomic signs, I should probably be more specific and say, I'm probably referring specifically to salivation because salivation you don't tend to see with paroxysmal dyskinesia. Urination and defecation are well, funny things, aren't they? So, um, you know, you don't typically expect to see urination in the same way you would with a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. But I can imagine some of these dogs having an episode for the first time might be scared, they might be fearful. They can go on a long time. I mean, I don't know, like um, Laurent tonight, if he keeps drinking, he'll need to go to the toilet in about 10 minutes. So, you know, if, if, if you've got an episode that goes on after, after more than 10, 15 minutes, you're going to need to go to the toilet and so they will defecate or urinate. So, no, you don't see them in the same way you do with a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, but be mindful of interpreting that. That's how I'd, how I'd look at it. Um, the next question is there. I think you refer to the study that you know we did together. Um, we've, uh, the study show high gluten antibody in border terrier, um, and this dog improved on the gluten-free diet. Um, have we, you know, tried to challenge this dog after putting them on the gluten-free diet by giving them gluten again to see that there is a link with the gluten? I think you got the answer to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the simple answer is we didn't do it in a controlled way that the owners of these dogs have inadvertently given gluten to these patients and they do relapse. So um, it wasn't a controlled trial. It wasn't done in a scientific way, but there is a clear link there that um, if an owner should accidentally slip up or drop a bit of bread on the floor and the dog gets it, these episodes can be appear. So the simple answer is yes. The next one, we're going to take another couple. With the study showing decreased antibodies, I presume in Border Terrier, was there a corresponding decrease in clinical sign associated with CECS? In addition, outside of ERG, I presume is EEG, 
Is there a reliable way to differentiate parcel seizures from dyskinesia? Yeah, so um, you know that there is there is a corresponding decrease in um, the antibody titer going down and the clinical signs improving. So um, you know that the graphs I'm showing with the antibodies did very much match the clinical signs too. Um, and yeah, EEG would be a great thing to do. So you know, is there anything else? Well, only only this diagnosis by inspection, which I say is a weak method, but um, you know, you look to see if if a dog. I mean, I say it again, really, that when a dog has um, abnormal movement in all four legs, having an episode, then for that to be a seizure, they have to be, it has to be a generalized seizure and they lose mentation. Whereas a partial seizure, you wouldn't have abnormal motor activity in, four, in all four legs. So that simple fact for me is enough to make it either a paroxysmal dyskinesia or, or, a, or a seizure. Right, two more questions from Sophie. Hi Sophie, when do you start pharmacologic treatment? Is this based on frequency and duration of the episode? Yeah, absolutely. So I try and avoid it, as I've said, but there will be the occasional case where I'll I'll definitely give it. I suppose I'm sometimes guided by breed. I, I haven't said today that the Cavaliers do seem to respond quite well to acetazolamide. So if it's a Cavalier with um, very frequent episodes, the owners are concerned and the duration is long, then um, I'll give acetazolamide to those dogs. Um, but yeah, occasionally you will come across one that has several episodes a day that are quite long in duration affecting that dog's quality of life. And, and that's my guidance, but um, that is, it's only my, my view, and I think others may, may differ in that. In that I think I will agree totally with that. And, you know, the study we did on Labrador and Jack Russell really showed the importance of determining for one individual the natural history of the disease. Um, this, the frequency is very erratic in this dog. They tend to have cluster, not in terms of daily event, but week, you know, many during a week, they may have a lot of event, then nothing for months. And I always think it's good to have a three month period without any treatment. So you can determine for that given dog what is the natural history. Because without that, it's very difficult to assess is it responding to a drug or not. Um, people tend to go to the vet when they have a problem, which is usually during the crisis, during the cluster. And if you give any drug, you may wrongly think is responding to the drug. But in fact, is entering a period of quiescence in a way there is no, it was not supposed to be any event. So very important to have this, you know, three month period at least of to observe the natural history on, on the dog. And I, think, I think the other thing to say that it's quite important that anything we ever produce in the future now with, with treatments and things needs to consider that, I think, that these dogs can improve. Um, so it's a really important bit to include into any research on, on response to movement disorders, the treatment response. The last question for you, Mark. Do you use phenobarbitone or levetiracetam to exclude or differentiate paroxysmal dyskinesia from a seizure? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, I tend to say yes, but let me let me elaborate on that. So phenobarbital is the drug I would choose if I'm not sure what the episode might be. And I tend to find most seizures have some response to phenobarbital. Having said that, I'm not necessarily using it to differentiate between the two. I mean, the one the one breed that immediately springs to mind for me is the German wirehead pointers. Um, oh, sorry, German shorthead pointers. I don't know what them. So German shorthead pointers can get a type of paroxysmal dyskinesia. Um, we've seen a lot of them in the UK where they, it almost looks like the dancing Doberman condition we saw many years ago, which we don't see so much of now, though they sporadically come up. But they're dogs that have career. So um, career is a clinical sign that looks a bit like an involuntary dance that comes on with movement. So a, a paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia. And for some reason, those dogs respond really, really well to um, phenobarbital. It was, it was Tom, it's Bristol, Tom Harcourt Brown that first found them. And we've now seen a good handful of these dogs. So just because they respond to phenobarbital doesn't necessarily mean they're epileptic seizures. And I do believe there are probably other movement disorders, other paroxysmal dyskinesia out there that may respond to phenobarb. So it's on my list of treatments that I would give to a dog with paroxysmal dyskinesia. Well down, you know, I'll try some of the others first, but I would consider it some struggle with other medication. I have to put this last question because it's important differentiation to make. It's about young bulldog having this involuntary head movement from side to side. Is it a paroxysmal dyskinesia? Yeah, so um, I think um, when, when we're thinking of something like that, this side to side movement, for me, that's much more of a tremor. So I think it's fair to say, yes, it's a movement disorder, but no, it's for me, it's not a type of paroxysmal dyskinesia. So it's um, a tremor these dogs are having. Um, 
And so it's quite quite distinct to the, the paroxysmal dyskinesias we've been talking about tonight. Very good. Um, if you want to all join me to say a massive um, virtual thank you to uh, Mark, um, I'll let you put some nice comments you know, for him. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to put on the slide what we've got in uh, stock for you for the next few first day of this lockdown. Um, next week, we've got the queen of neuroimaging, Ines Carrera, fantastic uh, radiologist with you know, amazing experience on MRI, talking about imaging of FC versus acute hydrated um, nucleus puposis extrusion. The following week on the 30th, uh, on the first day, uh, a very good friend of mine, Chris Falzon, uh, who is a neurologist in Italy, will talk about how do I manage disc associated wobbler. And we've got another eminent neurologist joining us on the 7th of May to talk about how do I manage carry syringomyia, to talk about all the different drugs available and when do we use them. Um, Thank you very much again to Mark. Thank you, Simon. And we hope to see you again in um, next week for uh, the talk with Ines Carrier. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Goodbye.